Hi, thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to be looking at this geometric series here. This is what black pen, red pen refers to as his best friend. It's 1 over 1 minus z equals 1 plus z plus z squared plus z cubed plus dot dot dot. And this is valid for any complex number z with magnitude less than 1. I, I won't prove that today. Um, so if you've not seen that before, it's a very standard result um, and it comes from geometric series. But today I'm not going to be looking at complex numbers z, I'm going to be looking at when z is a matrix. Okay, so what does this thing hold for matrices? And obviously what is this right hand side when we're adding up an infinite number of matrices? Okay, so let's explore that. Firstly, the left hand side, 1 over 1 minus z, for complex numbers, I can also write as 1 minus z inverse. Okay, and now what I'm going to do, is, as I said, is look at matrices. So I'm going to swap z for capital A, where capital A is a matrix. Okay, so on the left hand side we get, now I'm not going to write 1 minus z, I'm going to write i minus a inverse, and that's because 1 and i, what 1 has as properties in the real numbers, i has similar properties in the matrices, for example, i times any matrix is the matrix itself, and the same 1 times any number is the number itself, and also, for example, a matrix times its inverse always equals i, and similarly, any real number, or any non-zero real number multiplied by its uh, in multiplicative inverse gives you 1. Okay, so we think of i as the, the 1, or the unit in matrices. Anyway, so what the left hand side is i minus a inverse, and the right hand side is 1 plus a plus a squared plus a cubed plus so on. So of course I haven't really said whether or not this is true, this is what we're going to explore. And of course in the complex number case we have the magnitude of z is less than 1, so perhaps we should have a corresponding property for a here. But we're not going to, we'll get to that in the end. Okay, firstly, one condition is I minus A has to be an inversible matrix for this to make any sense on the left-hand side. Okay, so that's one condition, I guess. So I minus A, I'll write here, uh, invertible. So we need that to be true for this to make any sense. But let's suppose I minus A is invertible. Well, let's look at the right-hand side. Oh, sorry, that's supposed to say I. Um, we can write that as the limit as N goes to infinity of the sum from I equals naught to N of a i, okay, because obviously that is a naught plus a one, so a, a to the naught which is i, a to the one which is a, a to the two which is a squared, and so on, all the way up to n, but we're getting n going to infinity, and that's where we get this infinite series. Now technically we have to have some metric for this, for this limit to exist firstly, it has to converge to something, but the notion of convergence means there's some sort of metric on the set of matrices. Uh, which we need to know, but for now I'm not going to go into too much detail there and complicate things, but uh, we can essentially treat A where we can as a real, or apply uh, convergence properties of real numbers to matrices, okay, because generally it will hold uh, regardless of what uh, metric you use on the set of matrices. Anyway, okay, so we've got this holds, so that's if and only if this holds, okay. Now let's multiply both sides by i minus a, so on the left hand side we'll just be left with the identity matrix. And on the right hand side what have we got? We've got limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals naught to n of a i multiplied by this thing here which is i minus a. Cool. And perhaps you can see here we're going to get some sort of telescoping series. So that's the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals naught to n a to the i times i is just a to the i, minus a to the i plus 1. Cool. And th this is perhaps where you can see a telescoping uh, series. So if we just look at the first few terms and the last few terms here, this is just the limit as n goes to infinity. Well, when we put in i is 0, we get a to the naught, which is i. And then we, when we put i is naught into there, we get minus a. Then we put in i is 1 into that, we get plus a. And then we're going to get a minus a squared. Then when we put i is 2, we get a plus a squared, and minus a cubed. And you can see the, a, the minus a and the a are going to cancel, the minus a squared and the a squared are going to cancel, and so on, until we go up to our last term. Well, let's look at the last two terms. So when I put in i is n minus 1, I get plus a to the n minus 1, and minus a to the n. And then when I put in i is n, I get a plus a to the n, minus a to the n plus 1. Squeeze it in right there. Cool, and of course all the middle terms are going to cancel, and all I'm left with is i minus a to the n plus 1. I don't know if you can see that there. There we 
again. <laughs> I've got a minus a to the n plus 1 there. Anyway, I'll be just left with the i and the a to the n plus 1. So this is just the limit as n goes to infinity of i minus a to the n plus 1. Okay, so let me clean this up and go back to this line here. So we've got this holds if and only if i equals this thing here. Okay, wonderful. Let me rumble this off. So what we wanted is for this to hold with matrices, and that's if and only if i equals the limit as n goes to infinity of i minus a to the n plus 1. Cool. Now, by algebra of limits sort of thing, I can bring this limit inside here. So I get this thing here. Okay, so that's if and only if this holds. And of course, this is if and only if the limit as n goes to infinity of a to the n plus 1 is the zero matrix. Wow, so if we have a to the n plus 1 goes to zero, which and also this is just the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of a to the n equals zero, then this cool identity for complex numbers also holds for matrices. Now, this is also the corresponding property to uh, the limit... In, in this case here, the limit as n goes to infinity of z to the n equals 0. And of course, that is true when the magnitude of z is less than 1. OK, cool. We've got this thing here. Now, how are we going to take the limit of a matrix raised to an exponent? Now, I'm going to look in the case where a is a diagonalizable matrix. So that just means um, if the eigenvalues of a are lambda 1 and lambda 2, say. So if the eigenvalues of a are lambda 1 and lambda 2, then that means I can write a, there's some matrix u, so that a equals this thing here. Now this is all, this all falls under diagonalizability, which you'll probably cover in any sort of standard linear algebra course. I won't go into it now, um, but we're going to assume that a can be written in this form, which means a is diagonalizable. So if we want a, so let's look at a to the n, or a squared, say, for example. And this is a really neat trick, and this is what's lovely about diagonalizable matrices. That's a times a again, which is going to give us this thing here. But look here, we've got u and u inverse, they cancel. And we're just left with this thing here times this thing here. But because it's a diagonal matrix, this can be written like this. Lambda 1, ooh, lambda 1 squared, lambda 2 squared, 0, 0, times u. Okay, and in fact, you can sort of use an induction argument to show that a to the n is equal to u inverse, lambda 1 to the n, lambda 2 to the n, 0, 0, times u. Okay, so if you've not seen that before, um, hopefully that's just sort of a quick sketch proof and you can convince yourself that this is true using induction. That a to the n equals u inverse times uh, this matrix here, lambda 1 to the n, 0, 0, lambda 2 to the n, uh, then followed by u at the end. So if we could look back here, we want the limit. Oh, we want the limit as n goes to infinity of u inverse lambda 1 to the n, 0, 0, lambda 2 to the n, u equals 0. Now, if lambda 1 and lambda 2 have magnitude less than 1, so if lambda 1, lambda 2 are less than 1, then can you see this matrix here, when I take n to infinity, u inverse and u are constant matrices, and so this limit here, I'm just focusing on this middle matrix, this will go to zero and this will go to zero. So all in all, this product will go to zero. So all in all, what we've shown is that if we have a matrix A, such that A minus A is invertible, A is diagonalizable, and the eigenvalues of A have magnitude less than one, then we can use this argument here and sort of arrive at this and then note that because the magnitudes of lambda one and lambda two are less than one, this exponent n will mean that they go to zero as n gets bigger and bigger, which means this matrix as a whole gets go to zero. So u inverse times zero times u is obviously the zero matrix. So uh, sort of reverse engineering going backwards, we can conclude that i minus a inverse 
is equal to i plus a plus a squared plus and so on. So we've shown that um, this inverse matrix can actually be written as the infinite sum of matrices, which I think is quite cool how we can compare matrices and things that work for complex numbers um, quite well. This is sort of like the very basic one when you're introduced to infinite series of matrices, and I really recommend you go and have a play with other functions and use their Taylor series. So for example, e to the x, you know, is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x to the 3 over 3 factorial, and so on. What is e to the power of a matrix? Sort of using that definition. Okay, but hopefully this has given you a nice little insight into infinite series and matrices, if you've not seen this before. Anyway, uh, if you did enjoy this video, please consider subscribing. It's free and it helps me out loads. Uh, I'm on the road to 300 subscribers, so hopefully I can hit that soon. Uh, but anyway, that's all for now. Have a great day. See ya.